Hi, I'm Dr. Edgar Jimenez, Director of Medical Critical Care Orlando Regional Medical Center. And over the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about the use of esophageal pressure monitoring for determining transpulmonary pressures as a tool to adjust PEEP and your overall ventilatory strategy. During lung injury, the alveolar becomes unstable and we start seeing repetitive alveolar closing and expansion, a term that has been coined as race. This is further accentuated by the positioning of the patient in a supine position, the weight of the organs. When you have an increase of capillary permeability and you have an increase of in intravascular lung water, and of course this is aided to the deactivation of surfactant and many other inflammatory changes that we have within the lung that destabilize the alveolar and allow it to collapse during the expiratory phase. So it appears that PEEP not only improves oxygenation, it also stabilizes alveoli and probably decreases the atelic trauma. In this model, we're going to show you how the progressive application of PEEP is going to show further lung stability particularly alveolar stability. You see here with a PEEP of zero, how the alveoli are very unstable, opening and closing at each moment of expiration. With a PEEP of five, there's barely a, an improvement for a few cycles and then it starts dropping again. And as we progressively increase the PEEP to 10, and to 15, and to 20, we see progressive alveolar recruitment and stabilization with less collapse during the expiratory phase. We believe that these changes the pattern of atelic trauma that we may be seeing for the use of very low PEEP in some of our patients. So how do we know that we have an open lung PEEP? How do we know that we reach a PEEP that keeps the lung open during the expiratory phase? There are many ways. We can use the table from the ARDS net. We can use higher and lower than 15 following the alveoli loves and express trial. We can do a decremental PEEP trial. What we're going to be seeing here over the next few minutes is how to adjust it using esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressures. So how do we measure the transpulmonary pressure and how do we manage the acute lung injury and ARDS patients using transpulmonary pressures? Well, we need to take into account that the plateau pressure is just measuring one side of the equation. When you have decreased chest wall compliance uh, caused by obesity, edema with anasarchic patients, changes in intra-abdominal pressure after surgery, after septic resuscitations, with pregnancy, with chest wall deformities, or with burns, there are going to be changes in the chest wall that are going to significantly affect the way you measure your plateau pressure. The plateau pressure measures only the airway pressure in a static moment. We need to know the transpulmonary pressure, and we have used the uh, plateau pressure as the surrogate for measuring this number. However, the best way we can go about measuring this transpulmonary pressure is by measuring the other side of the equation, which is the esophageal pressure at the same time. That will give us the transpulmonary pressure. Why? Because if we look at this CAT scan, we will see that the esophagus is in very close proximity to the pleural space. At this point in time in the retrocardiac area, in about the distal third of the esophagus is where the, it's most proximal, and the pressure of the esophagus is very close to the pleural pressure, which will give us the true transpulmonary pressure. Well, we use a device that has a nasogastric tube that has a balloon that would fit in the distal part of the esophagus as the tube has been placed uh, either orogastrically or nasogastrically, like any other NG tube. So the hypothesis is patients with increased pleural pressures with conventional settings, if we don't give them enough pressure, we're going to cause underinflation, hypoxemia, and pulmonary vasoconstriction. Also, in these patients, we would have to raise the PEEP to maintain the positive transpulmonary pressure that improves the aeration and oxygenation without overdistension and preventing atelic trauma. So the goal is to provide enough transpulmonary pressure to maintain an acceptable oxygenation, 
to prevent the race, the repetitive alveolar closing and expansion, and to minimize over distension. In this model, we will show the different levels of transpulmonary pressure in lung injury model. You will see in the upper graph the tidal volume, in the middle graph the esophageal pressure, and in the lower graph the transpulmonary pressure. You can see that the injury has produced a significant drop in the transpulmonary PEEP pressure when you see it at a level of minus six. This means that there may be some significant atelectasis caused at this point in time with this injury. So in order to compensate for that, as we see here in the next model, you have to adjust the PEEP at increments until you eventually get the desired effect in which the saturations improve and you can adjust your FiO2 as well. In this example here, we have reached a PEEP of 15, which has a transpulmonary pressure of 5. Look how interesting that the transpulmonary plateau is 16 whereas the measure plateau is 32. This is essentially twice as much. This is an interesting strategy to decrease the repetitive alveolar closing and expansion. The atelic trauma that we hypothesize is seen when we have negative transpulmonary pressures at the end expiratory phase. In the future, we are going to need more research to find out whether there's a change in morbidity and mortality and whether we find even better or more accurate ways of determining our people.